Okay, so welcome to this video. In this video, what we're going to talk about is multi-drug transporters. Okay, so multi-drug transporters. Right, so the outline for the structure of this video then. Firstly, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss what a multi-drug transporter actually is. So how are they different from just a standard active transporter? Okay, what uh, distinguishes them from other active transporters? Okay, then we're going to discuss the five main categories of multi-drug transporters. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to go through each of the five main categories of multi-drug transporters, and we're going to have a look at uh, examples of um, those uh, multi-drug transporters. Okay, and we're going to look at the way that they work, or at least what is understood of the way that they function. Okay, right. And then we'll look at uh, some of their uh, roles in physiology. Right. Uh, so the first thing then that we need to discuss is what a multi-drug transporter is. And in order to understand what a multi-drug transporter is, we firstly need to have a decent understanding of what an active transporter is. We're going to start off by discussing what an active transporter is. We'll talk about the two different types of active transporters, and then we'll talk about what a multi-drug transporter is and how uh, multi-drug transporters are all active transporters, but not all active transporters are multi-drug transporters. Okay, so let's discuss then what an active transporter is. So, an active transporter is something that's involved in moving a substrate molecule up its electrochemical gradient, okay? Uh, and that's why it's going to have to be an active process, because if it was just a passive transporter, then it would always move the substrate down its electrochemical gradient, whereas active transporters are going to move them against uh, the way that is energetically favourable. Okay, so, there are two different types of active transporters. Firstly, there are primary active transporters, okay? And uh, these are active transporters which move a substrate molecule up their electrochemical gradient by getting the energy from a chemical reaction, okay? So let's say that this is a membrane here. We could imagine it's the cell membrane or we could imagine it's the membrane of an intracellular organelle. And this little blob in the membrane, which I'll colour in in turquoise here, let's say this is going to represent our primary active transporter. Okay, so what it's going to do is it's going to move the substrate molecule across the cell membrane. Let's say it's going to move it upwards here. Okay, and this new compartment that it's moving the substrate molecule into um, has, well, it, it's moving the substrate up its electrochemical gradient. So what that means is that when you move the substrate from here to here, you're having to put energy into that process, okay? It's not a passive process. You're not getting energy out by moving it this way. You're having to put energy in, okay? And uh, primary active transporters get the energy that they need to move the substrate molecule against its electrochemical gradient, i.e. up an energy level like uh, this, uh, from a chemical reaction, okay? And the chemical reaction that usually occurs is the hydrolysis of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So usually what primary active transporters do is they couple the movement of the substrate against its electrochemical gradient uh, to the hydrolysis of ATP. It's not always the case that it's coupled to the hydrolysis of ATP, but usually it's the case. Okay, so this is a chemical reaction here that releases energy and therefore the energy that's released can then be used to move the substrate up its electrochemical gradient. So that's a primary active transporter. Uh, now let's contrast that to a secondary active transporter. A secondary active transporter doesn't get the energy that it needs to move the substrate molecule up its electrochemical gradient from a chemical reaction. Instead, a secondary active transporter gets the energy it needs by allowing some other molecule to move down its electrochemical gradient. Okay, so let me draw a picture here. So, here again is our active transporter now, which we'll assume is a secondary active transporter, and I should colour it in greens to keep the colour coding there. Okay, 
and let's say it's also going to move this substrate molecule up its electrochemical gradient, so it's going to have to put energy in to do this. And where is it going to get that energy from? Well, it's going to allow another molecule to move across the membrane every time you move this substrate molecule across. And these, this other molecule moving will then be moving down its electrochemical gradient. And when it moves down its electrochemical gradient, it will release energy. And that energy that's released will be used to move this substrate molecule up its electrochemical gradient. So there are two different types of secondary active transporters. Okay? There's what is known as a symporter. And this is when um, the molecule that you're going to move down its electrochemical gradient is going to move in the same way, uh, sorry, in the same direction as the substrate molecule. Okay, so here's our molecule, which I'll just abbreviate as M. And we're going to move it from here to here in the same direction as we're moving the substrate molecule. But unlike the substrate molecule, which was moving up its electrochemical gradient, and therefore we had to put energy in to move the substrate molecule up here, the M molecule is moving down its electrochemical gradient when it moves in this direction and therefore we're getting energy out and that energy that we're getting out is what's driving uh, the movement of the substrate molecule up. Okay, so when uh, the two molecules are moved in the same direction um, that's known as a symporter secondary active transporter. Alternatively you can have what's known as an antiporter secondary active transporter. Okay, and this is when the other molecule that you're moving is going to be moving in the opposite direction to the substrate molecule. So here's your substrate molecule going up its electrochemical gradient. And now every time you move that substrate molecule, you're going to move this other molecule in the opposite direction. And this time it will be the case that moving this way is moving down its electrochemical gradient. So it all depends on what the electrochemical gradient across this membrane is for this molecule as to which direction it needs to go in. Okay, so uh, second reactive transporters can be divided into these symporters and these antiporters then. And we're going to see a lot of examples of antiporters in this uh, video. Okay, the other thing that I should just say before we move on is that uh, it's not necessarily the case that it's one substrate molecule for one other molecule here. You could be moving two of these N molecules here, and we'll see examples of that later on. Okay, right. Uh, the principle then is just that you're having another um, molecule or molecules moving along with the substrate and they'll be moving down their electrochemical gradient and the energy released by that process is going to be what's fueling the movement of the substrate up its electrochemical gradient. Okay, and that's the idea of secondary active transport. Right, okay, so... These then are the active transporters, okay? Now, there's a massive great family of active transporters in life, okay? Not all of them are multi-drug transporters. All the multi-drug transporters are active transporters, okay? So this is effectively a subset of the active transporters. But there are loads of active transporters which are not multi-drug transporters. So, it's about time then that I told you what the actual defining feature of a multi-drug transporter actually is. What are we studying in this video? Okay, well, a multi-drug transporter is an active transporter that has a, in, an incredibly broad specificity. Okay, so this is the defining feature. An extremely broad specificity. Okay, now what do I mean by that? And I'm just going to have to concentrate for a moment on getting the word specificity written properly. Okay, there we go. Okay, so what do I mean by a very broad specificity? Okay, well, most active transporters uh, do not have a very broad specificity. If we take, for example, a really famous example, a very, very famous example of an active transporter is the sodium-potassium pump, okay? More correctly called the sodium-potassium ATPase, okay? And this is a prime reactive transporter. It sits in the cell membrane, it chucks free sodium ions out, and it brings in two potassium ions, okay? And every time it does that, it hydrolyzes a molecule of ATP, okay? Uh, so this is one of the sort of prototypical active transporters, 
Okay, now this does not have a broad specificity. The things it transports are sodium ions and potassium ions, and that's it. Okay, these multi drug transporters. They have an incredibly broad specificity. There is not just one substrate molecule that they move. They can move a huge number of different substrate molecules. And generally, what they do is they move the substrate molecule out of the cell. Okay, so they are what are known as exporters. And this is probably another piece of terminology I should have mentioned when we were doing active transporters. Okay, so if you have an active transporter on the cell membrane, then active transporters which move their substrate out of the cell are known as exporters, and active transporters which move their substrate into the cell are known as importers. Okay, so those are two other important pieces of terminology. So multi drug transporters are generally on the cell surface membrane. Okay, so if I draw a picture of this, so let's have a picture of our cell here. Okay, so this is some arbitrary cell. Let's say it's got a nucleus, it's not a prokaryotic cell, it's a eukaryotic cell. Okay, but we're going to see lots of examples from prokaryotic cells later on. Okay, and on the cell membrane here, here is our primary active transporter that's going to be a multi drug transporter. So it's going to be an exporter. That's one of the defining features of multi drug transporters, they export things okay, out of the cell. Okay, so they're going to move their substrate out of the cell. They're going to either be a primary active transporter or a secondary active transporter. We're not going to fuss over that yet, where it actually gets the energy to do this from. We'll see that later on. Okay, um, and the key thing here, the key defining feature of all of these things is that this is not set. There are absolutely loads of molecules that these things can chuck out in exactly the same way. Okay, so they have an incredibly broad specificity. The substrate molecule which they transport is not just one molecule. There are loads of molecules they can chuck out. That is what is meant by a multi drug transporter. An active transporter, this is an exporter generally, and which transports a huge number of different substrates. It doesn't just have one set substrate and that's all that it can transport. Okay, many, many active transporters do just have one substrate and that's all they can transport. A nice example is here, but there are other examples uh, beyond that. Okay, so that's what distinguishes the multi-drug transporters as a specific subset of the active transporters, that they are these active transporters that can move a huge number of different molecules. Okay, right. So, before I tell you what the characteristics all of these molecules generally have, I'm just going to give you a little bit more terminology. So, multi-drug transporters also have another name, okay? It's not uncommon to hear them referred to as multi-drug resistant transporters. So, hardly a, much of a change, but still, I don't want you to get confused. So, multi-drug resistance transporters is just another name for multi-drug transporters. And multi-drug resistance transporters can be abbreviated down, so it's often abbreviated down to MDR transporters. So if you see people referring to MDR transporters, they are just referring to multi-drug transporters, but they're calling them multi-drug resistance transporters, MD for multi-drug, and then R for resistance. Okay, right, so that's just another piece of terminology that people use um, for the name of multi-drug transporters. Right, okay, so now let's talk about what the characteristic features that all of these substrate molecules for these multi drug transporters generally have because there is general chemical features that all of the substrate molecules have for these multi drug transporters. Okay, so let me uh, explain these now. So, the most important one is that these substrate molecules are generally very lipophilic. Okay, and there's another word for lipophilic. Uh, another word that pretty much means the same thing is hydrophobic. Okay, so the molecules which these multi drug transporters can move are generally very lipophilic or hydrophobic. Now, what does that actually mean in terms of their chemical structure? Well, that means that they interact very well with lipid molecules and they don't interact very well with water molecules. But those things are really saying the same thing. And what it means is that the chemical structures of these molecules are incredibly neutral. 
okay? You don't have any polar bonds, and that's why these molecules don't interact very well with water, but do interact very well with lipid molecules, because lipid molecules are incredibly neutral molecules. You know, fat molecules is the other word for lipid molecules, and they're incredibly neutral, not very polar bonds anywhere, okay? Whereas water molecules, as I'm sure you know, are extremely polar molecules. Okay, oxygen has a far greater electronegativity than hydrogen atoms and therefore pulls the electrons in these bonds towards it so it gets a partial negative charge and hydrogens end up with a partial positive charges. So water is a very polar molecule. You've got this unequal distribution of charge. Okay, these molecules that are hydrophobic, they have incredibly um, neutral distribution of charge, okay, so an even distribution of charge and everything's just neutralized out basically. Okay, and that means that water molecules can't interact very well with these because if you think about how well water molecules can interact with other water molecules, okay, if I draw another water molecule here and I'll just move this up in a moment. Okay, right, so if I've got another water molecule here, here is my oxygen with a negative partial negative charge and here are my hydrogens with partial positive charge, where in fact these molecules can form hydrogen bonds because the partial positively charged hydrogen here is exactly what we would call a hydrogen bond donor. Okay, so this is the hydrogen bond donor. Okay, the only characteristics that you need to be a hydrogen bond donor are a hydrogen with a partial positive charge, so this is most definitely a hydrogen bond donor. And then this oxygen molecule has the capacity to be a hydrogen bond acceptor. Okay, and you need slightly more uh, characteristics to be a hydrogen bond acceptor. Okay, to be a hydrogen bond acceptor, you need a partial negative charge, which this oxygen certainly has, but you also need a lone pair of electrons. Okay, now that water, sorry, that oxygen atom of that water molecule actually has two lone pairs of electrons, one here and one here. Okay, so all it actually needs is one to be a hydrogen bond acceptor. So you can certainly form a hydrogen bond between this hydrogen here, the hydrogen bond donor, and the oxygen here, the hydrogen bond acceptor. Okay, and that's a very, very uh, strong form of intermolecular bonding. Okay, so this is called a hydrogen bond between these water molecules. Okay, so that's a very, very powerful intermolecular bond. Okay, so water molecules can interact with each other very, very powerfully. Whereas if you suddenly ram one of these water molecules against a very neutral molecule, then it can't form anywhere near as strong intermolecular bonds with that neutral molecule as it can with another water molecule. And therefore, water will always prefer to bind to other water molecules rather than lipid molecules. So what tends to happen is lipid molecules get aggregated together uh, so that they don't have to interact with water molecules. And that's why when you try and mix fat with water, uh, or oil with water, cooking oil with water, it doesn't work. The two separate out very, very quickly. Even if you mix and shake it as much as you like, they'll separate back out because the water wants to interact with other water molecules and therefore shoves all of the lipid molecules together so that the interaction between water and uh, lipid molecules is minimized, basically. Okay, right, so lipid molecules end up aggregated together simply because water molecules push them all together so that the water molecules can interact with each other. Okay, so these two words here go together. Being hydrophobic means that you end up lipophilic because the water molecules push you all together, okay? And the characteristic chemical feature that defines these two properties is the molecules are neutral. They don't have polar bonds, which is why they can't interact very strongly with the extremely polar water molecules. Okay, right. Uh, so, the next a uh, defining chemical feature of these substrate molecules is that they are planar. Okay, now what does that mean? That means that generally they are quite flat molecules. Okay, they lie in a plane. Okay, like so. So planar molecules generally have a lot of aromatic structures within them because the molecule benzene, if I draw benzene out here, benzene is a perfect hexagon. Okay, um, benzene, remember, the model for benzene is that it's uh, 
six carbon atoms in a ring like so with alternating double and single bonds. Okay, and then each carbon also has a hydrogen off, so this is benzene, which is the ultimate example of an aromatic compound. Okay, however, this model is slightly wrong, okay, and let me tell you why it's wrong. Because double bonds usually have a shorter length than single bonds, Okay, so if benzene actually did look like this, if it actually was this, then it would not be a perfect hexagon. In reality, these double bonds, well, the better way of thinking about this is that each of these bonds between every single one of these six carbons, okay, is almost one and a half bonds, okay, because benzene is a perfect hexagon, the real benzene is a perfect hexagon, okay, so we know it isn't these alternating single and double bonds. The better way to think about it is that each one of these uh, bonds between these six carbons is one and a half bonds, okay, so people sometimes uh, instead draw it like this. Okay, they draw it as the six-membered ring, and then they put a circle around this. And what this sort of represents is the fact that the uh, six electrons that are in these three double bonds, so if we look at this model, there are these three extra bonds here, the three second of the double bonds, okay? And each of these bonds has two electrons in. So in total, in this bond, this bond, and this bond, there are six electrons, okay? And it's better to think about these six electrons as being equally distributed among all of the uh, six carbons. And in fact, what actually happens is they lie in rings uh, that are above and below the benzene ring. And this is going to become more important later on. Okay, and those rings are called delocalized rings. Okay, so that's really what this uh, is representing here. It's representing the fact that these six electrons are really in rings around uh, the ring of carbon atoms. So this is delocalized ring. So if I draw this again, the uh, six carbon atoms really do sit in a plane, okay? It's a perfect hexagon. And then above the ring of carbon atoms, you then have this delocalized ring of electrons here. And you also have the exact same thing below here. And the six electrons are within these rings somewhere, okay? So these are the delocalized rings here in blue, sitting above and below the benzene ring. Okay, so benzene is the ultimate example of a planar molecule. It's a perfectly flat ring of carbon atoms. Okay, so if these substrate molecules are going to be pretty planar, it suggests that they have a lot of aromatic structures within them. Okay, because that's the ultimate way of uh, getting uh, a planar molecule. Okay, so we've had these two chemical features so far, lipophilic uh, or hydrophobic, which means that the molecule is going to be neutral, and then it's also going to be planar, okay? Uh, right, so uh, there are two other chemical features that I just want to talk about, okay, which are that uh, generally the size of these molecules is uh, less than 800 Daltons, okay? So what does that mean? DA here stands for Daltons. Now, Daltons is the way that usually you measure the mass of a molecule, okay? So, a proton is around one Dalton in weight, okay? So, uh, the, the weight of a molecule is determined by the atoms that make it up. Okay, and you need to add up how many protons and how many neutrons are in that molecule, and then that's usually the amount of Daltons that the molecule weighs, okay, because one proton and one neutron both weigh around one Dalton. Okay, so really, Daltons is just the unit of molecular weight. Okay, right. Uh, so, they're not that big molecules, not massive anyway. They're generally quite small molecules, okay? And finally, one that seems a little bit counterintuitive with what I've already told you, which is that they are usually weakly cationic, okay? Now, what do I mean by that? That seems to contrast with what I've said over here. I've said that the molecules are neutral, and I'm saying that they're going to have a positive charge. Okay, well, most of the molecule is going to be neutral, okay? And most of the bonds in the molecule are not going to be polar, i.e. there's not going to be an unequal 
distribution of the electrons between uh, the two components of the bonds. Okay, so there isn't going to be any partial charges, or many partial charges, in the molecule. However, portions of the molecule are actually going to have proper positive charges. So understand the difference between this statement and this statement. This is all about the fact that there aren't uh, in the bulk of the structure, and let me just draw out a little picture here. In the bulk of the structure, you're going to have a very, very neutral structure. And that's going to be because the individual covalent bonds are not going to have uneven uh, distribution of charges. So you're not going to have polar bonds, basically. However, then at portions of the structure, you then actually do have portions that really do have a positive charge. So this isn't a partial positive charge. By like we saw in the hydrogens in the water molecules, this is a real positive charge. Okay, so that means that the whole molecule actually has a real positive charge, whereas water, water, even though it was a polar molecule, it didn't actually have a real charge. Okay, it was just partial charges because of the uneven distribution of the electrons in these bonds. Okay, these molecules are actually going to have real positive charges, i.e. the entire thing viewed as a whole really does have a positive charge, but it will generally be localized to a certain area of the molecule, basically. Okay, right. So most of the molecule is incredibly neutral and there aren't any polar bonds and it can't interact very well with water at all. Okay, so this is the big uh, lipophilic or hydrophobic portion. Okay, most of the molecule is incredibly planar. Uh, it's quite a small molecule, but then it does have this portion where you have a positive charge. Okay, generally, of course, generally, this is, these are all general things, so generally, they are weakly cationic. It's not a hard, fast rule. Okay, right. Uh, the hard, fast rules are generally that they are lipophilic, they are quite planar, and they are below 800 Daltons. This one's a more sort of weak rule that often they end up having uh, a weakly cationic charge. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, before then we go on to discuss the different categories of multi-drug transporters, I just want to um, give you a little bit of insight into uh, why this is so important. Okay, so as the name suggests, these transporters end up transporting a lot of um, drug molecules out of the cell. Okay, and a sort of colloquial um, term that has sprung up around these things is to call them the hydrophobic vacuum cleaners of cells. Okay, so these things are often referred to as hydrophobic vacuum cleaners. Basically, they clean out cells of hydrophobic molecules that are potentially dangerous. Okay, so many, many cells have multi-drug transporters on their cell membranes, and they're involved in chucking out hydrophobic molecules that are potentially dangerous to the cell. And unfortunately, a lot of the drug molecules that we use are hydrophobic molecules. And why are they hydrophobic molecules? Well, because that's the only way you can generally get molecules into cells. Okay, if they're really polar molecules, then they don't get across the lipid by there. Okay, uh, so molecules that actually generally get into cells are going to be hydrophobic. Obviously, many drugs that we use don't need to get into cells because they're acting on receptors on the surface of cells, but the drug molecules that we use that actually need to get into cells, they need to be hydrophobic so that they can get across the cell membrane, okay? And then they end up getting chucked out by these multi-drug transporters, which is why these multi-drug transporters are a big problem. Okay, now, the first thing that I want to talk about, just to give you a hint of where this is all going, is antibiotic resistance and multi-drug transporters. And I want to make sure that you understand what the difference between multiple drug resistance is and multi-drug resistance is, because there is a subtle difference between them. Okay, so these are the two terms we're trying to understand. The difference between multiple drug resistance in bacteria, okay, and then a slightly more scary uh, phenomenon, which is multi-drug resistance. So multiple drug resistance is the one that you would predict. Multi-drug resistance came as a bit of a shock when we first discovered this. Okay, so let me explain what the difference between them is. So, let's start with what antibiotic resistance is broadly, okay? So basically, if I draw a little picture of bacterial cells, 
we discovered antibiotics. Penicillin was the first one that we found, okay? It was made by some fungus to attack bacteria, and we jumped on this. It was a medical revolution. Uh, the public uh, lost their fear completely of infectious disease. We could now cure bacterial infections, and they were no longer life-threatening because of the discovery of antibiotics. Brilliant. The problem is that natural selection shows its face, okay? Because if you throw antibiotics at a population of bacteria, eventually you will just so happen to come across a bacteria that has a mutation that means that it can survive that antibiotic. Okay, so within a population of, let's say, billions and billions and billions of bacteria, there might just be one that just happens to have a mutation that means that it is not going to respond to that antibiotic. Okay, so your antibiotic then kills all of the other ones. Okay, so let's say this one dies, 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 this one dies. But then this little one that just happens to be individual and had something that meant that this antibiotic didn't work on it survives, okay? And now all of its friends are dead. And it doesn't care about that because now all of the uh, nutrients are for it. All of its friends have died. It has got loads of nutrients and what it's going to do is it's going to divide and 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 before long you will end up with a whole population of cells which all have this mutation which means that they are resistant to the antibiotic and this repopulates the entire bacterial population so you end up with a bacterial population that is all resistant to your antibiotic. Okay, so that is antibiotic resistance, that's the basic idea, and that's a process of evolution, okay, so the bacterial population has evolved, okay, into a population that is now completely resistant to the antibiotic by a process of natural selection. Okay, survival of the fittest. Right, so what is the phenomenon of multiple drug resistance? Okay, well the phenomenon of multiple drug resistance is that, let's say the first antibiotic we treated these cells with was penicillin. Okay, right, and uh, we then keep, kept treating with penicillin and eventually now our bacterial population has evolved into this penicillin resistant population. Okay, so let's say we now move over to using a different antibiotic. So what antibiotic can I come up with that we can use? Let's say we use ciprofloxacin, a fluoroquinolone antibiotic instead. Okay, and again, what's now going to happen is in this massive great population of bacteria that are now all resistant to penicillin, you might just have one bacteria, let's say one bacteria, that has some mutation that means that it is not going to respond to the ciprofloxacin the way all the others do. So what then is going to happen is all the others will die, Okay, all these other ones that were penicillin resistant here are going to die, but then this one survives. So let's colour this one in now a different colour. So let's colour it in purple. This one's the one that is both penicillin and ciprofloxacin resistant. And then it will then repopulate the entire population. And you will end up now with a population of cells that are both penicillin resistant and ciprofloxacin resistant. Okay, so we would say that this bacterial population is, has now got multiple drug resistance, okay, because it's resistant to penicillin and ciprofloxacin, okay, so that's a perfectly sensible term, okay. And what then is multi-drug resistance? Well, multi-drug resistance is quite fantastic, okay? This was the phenomenon that we first observed, and it came as a bit of a shock at first, okay? So what we did is, if I draw the picture out again, let's say we treat the cells with penicillin, okay? So here's our original bacterial population, okay, which is not resistant to any antibiotic yet. Let's say we treat it with penicillin, Okay, so we treat it with penicillin, and again, the same phenomenon happens. We just happen to have one bacteria that has a mutation that means that it can survive. So all of the others die, okay, and then this one, let's say here, survives, okay, and now it's going to repopulate, and it will make a massive great population of uh, bacterial cells, which are all resistant to penicillin. 
Well, this now is the phenomenon of multi-drug resistance. What if we now bring along our second antibiotic, ciprofloxacin, okay, and these bacterial cells which we've treated with penicillin and therefore we would expect them now to be penicillin resistant, they now are resistant to ciprofloxacin, even though we've never treated them with ciprofloxacin. And then we might bring along antibiotic-free, okay, let's say uh, tet some tetracycline antibiotic, and they're resistant to that as well, okay? This is the phenomenon of multi-drug resistance, that you d treat them with one antibiotic, okay? The population evolves to be resistant to that antibiotic, but this new population is now resistant to loads of other antibiotics that you have never actually treated this population with. So it might be resistant to ciprofloxacin, which it's never been treated with, okay? Uh, it might be resistant to the tetracyclines, okay? Or erythromycins, all of those antibiotics, okay? Even though it's never ever been treated with those, this is the phenomenon of multi-drug resistance. And this came as a bit of a shock at first. Now, what has actually happened here is that this original cell that got a mutation that meant that it could survive penicillin, what it has actually done is it might have overexpressed some multi-drug transporter, okay, some one of these hydrophobic vacuum cleaners that trucks drug molecules out. Okay, and that's how it was able to survive the penicillin. The penicillin sh was chucked out by the multi-drug transporter. And now the reason it's resistant to all these other antibiotics, even though it's never been treated with them, never been exposed to them, is because the multi-drug transporter that it was using against penicillin also works against those. Okay, so it's now a population that is resistant to loads of antibiotics, even though it's never been treated with them, just because it completely overexpresses this hydrophobic vacuum cleaner. Okay, so that's the phenomenon of multi-drug resistance, and it's slightly scarier at the multiple drug resistance. Okay, so there's a subtle difference between those two concepts. Okay, right, so that's um, a really important part of the study of multi-drug transporters, the fact that these are incredibly involved in bacterial resistance, specifically this scary type of bacterial resistance, which is multi-drug resistance, where suddenly these bacterial populations become resistant to drugs that they've never even been treated with. Okay, right, so the next thing we want to talk about is um, the five different categories of multi-drug transporters and then we will move on to going through each one of these categories in turn and looking at examples. Okay, so the five families of multi-drug transporters then. Okay, so we'll start off with the main family, the one that we're going to study first which is a family known as the ABC transporters. Now, I should say that um, these families, some of them are massive great families of active transporters and contain examples of multi-drug transporters, i.e. the entire family is not necessarily multi-drug transporters. It's a family of active transporters that contains examples of multi-drug transporters. Okay, so this ABC transporter family contains a huge number of active transporters. Okay, and it's found in all different forms of life. You find it in bacterial cells, you find it in human cells. Okay, you find many of these in human cells, which we're going to see later on. Okay, however, many of these ABC transporters are not multi-drug transporters. Okay, some of them are just normal active transporters. One of them is actually a chloride channel. Okay, the famous CFTR is an ABC transporter, the protein that's involved in cystic fibrosis, and it's not um, a, an active transporter at all. It's an ATP-gated chloride channel. Okay, uh, so not all of the members of this family are multi-drug transporters. It's a family that contains examples of multi-drug transporters. Okay, so ABC transporters, what does the ABC stand for? It stands for ATP, that's the A, and then binding, that's the B, and then the C is for cassette, okay? Uh, and we'll see what the origin of it being called that is later on. Okay, right, the next family of transporters is what's known as the RND transporters, okay? And 
um, we'll see a very beautiful example of an R&D transporter later on, which is present in E. coli. But you do find R&D transporters uh, in humans as well. Okay, a famous one is the NPC1 uh, transporter, which is important in cholesterol handling. Handling. Okay, right. So what does R&D stand for? R&D stands for resistance. That's the R. Okay. N is for nodulation. Okay. And then the D is for division, resistance, nodulation, division transporters. Okay, right. Next family of multi drug transporters is the MFS transporters. And again, this is a massive, great family of active transporters, which contains examples of multi drug transporters. Okay, but there are many proteins in this family that are not multi drug transporters. Okay, so MFS transporter stands for the major facilitator, facilitator superfamily of transporters. Okay, and we will see an example from E. coli, namely the EMRD transporter, which is an example of an MFS multi drug resistance transporter. Okay, next family of multi drug transporters is the SMR transporters, okay, and SMR in this case stands for small, okay, small, and then M is for multi-drug, and then uh, the R is then for resistance, so small multi-drug resistance transporters, okay, and again we'll see another example from E. coli of a small multi-drug resistance transporter, namely the EMRE. Finally, then, there is a relatively new family of multi-drug resistance transporters, which are the MATE transporters, okay, which stands for the multi-drug and toxin extrusion transporters. So M, again, is for multi-drug, okay, and then the AND, sorry, the A is for AND, uh, okay, and then the T is for toxins, multi-drug and toxins, extrusion. Actually, I think it's toxin rather than toxins. Extrusion. Okay, that makes more sense. Multi-drug and toxin extrusion transporter. Okay, and again, we will see an example from bacteria of a mate transporter, specifically the NORM transporter, which is found in uh, Vibrio cholerae, Neisseria gonorrhoeae, uh, also Vibrio parahemioliticus. Okay, uh, later on. Right, so we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video what we'll do is we'll begin our study of the individual uh, families of multi-drug transporters, and we'll begin with the ABC transporters.